Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this recap video. It's been a couple of weeks since we have done one. In fact, we're actually filming this one kind of out of sync with how we normally do. So it will probably go up, I don't know, at a random time during the week. Wednesday or Thursday maybe. Yeah, it just happened that we have a kind of crummy day for gardening projects outside. It's pretty breezy. We got a lot of rain overnight and this morning, which is awesome. So it's wet, breezy, and 57 is the high today. It's so weird end for May. end of May. Yeah. It is really crazy. I mean, it's awesome. I am not going to complain in our 10 day looks. I mean, we're barely getting into the 80s in our 10 yeah. day in June. Right. Mostly 70s. That's kind of unheard of. See, it feels like in, in May, we're already like approaching 100. Yeah. And June in the hundreds for sure. At yeah. least toward the middle to end part of it. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, it could shoot up there really yeah. quickly, but it feels co uh, coastal. Yeah. Doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It's amazing. I love it. I hope my tomatoes are okay out there. <laughs> Uh, so we're just going to do the last seven videos. I know that that means we'll have missed some, a few uh, before that, but the seven most recent videos that we put up. So the first one, um, planting 30 varieties of tomato and 10 varieties of pepper. So we uh, got the whole area prepped out there where we planted pumpkin vines and melon vines last year. And we used one little section of that to set up 21 tomato frames. There's three rows of seven, I think. And then I planted two others out there, but in a different spot. And then we planted four up in the raised bed garden, which leaves me, which I still haven't even potted up, but I have three like container appropriate varieties still in their little containers in the greenhouse. And I'll pot those up here soon. So that means 30 varieties this year, which is really fun. And they all, like when I showed them to you in that video, they had uh, been out during a fairly chilly night. And so they kind of had darkened, like the leaves had darkened in color a bit. I kind of thought, oh, I hope they come out of this. They have, like they've at least doubled in size already. It's crazy. They're already growing really well, so I'm happy about that. And then we went ahead and planted 10 varieties of pepper out in another area, kind of near the dahlias. So there were, I think, four different varieties of bell, uh, a couple different hot varieties, and so on and so forth. So the top comment from that video was from Lala Palooza. Flower shed is looking great. You should tie tags to the top ring of your cages. Might be easier to find once they grow. Yes. That is such a good idea. And I think somebody suggested that for dahlias too. I really should, like when we get the, we haven't even run ropes yet uh, to, for the staking system because the dahlias haven't even broke through the soil surface yet. Um, and I'm hoping all of this rain that we've been getting, I hope they don't rot. rot. Who knows? Every year is just so different, isn't it? Anyway, I was thinking when we get the rope run, we should do pull through tags on yeah. the top so that we can see very easily. That's such a good idea. Rita said, had to laugh out loud at you emptying your shoes. <laughs> How many times have you gotten a question about getting dirt in your shoes? Like every video maybe? Yeah, right. Yeah. Out there, it's particularly bad because that little section had been tilled because there were uh, there was a lot of leaves and grass clippings and stuff we had put on there. And so I don't know if you or Paul went out there and tilled it up. But yeah. anyway, it's like eight or ten inches of like fluff now, which is lovely to plant in. But it does get all up in your shoes, like worse than regular gardening. I enjoyed your planting today so much, and I love that you share your abundance with others. Keep up the good work, and thanks for taking us along the journey. I do get questions. It's funny. I get kind of both ends of the spectrum. I get questions like, why do you plant so many tomatoes? Well, we like to plant lots because I like to experiment with lots, but we also give a lot of them away. Um, and then I get other people who say, well, I have 96 in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? So, I mean, there's like kind of the two ends of the spectrum. Yeah. People doing different things and for different reasons, and it's all fun. Uh, Restored Hope said, excited to see grass. You should see it right now. It is so gorgeous. So Aaron and Paul, uh, I think you guys were working on that while I was working on this, right? Were we? Yeah. Yeah, because you were going to help aug the holes yeah, and ended up right. being a lot easier than I thought. So you yeah. guys worked on a different project. And um, yeah, so there's grass up. Like you can see the really thick green haze over yeah. that whole area. It's going to be really pretty. Um, wondering if Aaron can do a video on his method for seeding grass and the maintenance after seeding. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. With lots more sections to yeah. put together. Um, I did see there were, when I was reading through, a lot of people were wanting to know about, um, like if you put a fertilizer down before you seed it. Yeah, well, see, the thing is, is that like the way that you do a lot of things, I don't feel like my approach is necessarily correct. It's just the way that I do it. And so I would just well, have to caveat with like, well, this is just what I do. I'm not necessarily saying it's the right way. Because mm -hmm. there's, you know, you can spend forever leveling and, you know, adding a, a fertilizer, which, you know, 
You didn't. I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I did for the first time put that compost layer down mm -hmm. with that sifter, mm -hmm. um, and that was that was pretty awesome. Yeah, that was that thing that rolled. I think we had a little bit of that footage yeah. in there. Um, and so it's just a sifter that they filled with compost and they were just rolling it over the top and it puts just the finest layer. And I feel like it kind of presses everything down a little bit too, yeah. which is good. Well, they say it's good to like roll over your seat after you put your seat down. I mean, okay. So like the quickly, the steps are just to like level out your surface, make sure that there's no like large pieces of bark or rock or, you know, anything like that. Just make sure it's, you know, as, as level as you can get it. Um, and you want it to be fairly like, you don't want it to be tilled you know, cause it needs to be like fairly compact. Um, and then you put your seed down and then you're supposed to roll over it and kind of like push it down, but not, not much. You mm -hmm. want to push it down just ever so slightly into the soil. So just rolling something or raking over it can help. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that, that sifter is awesome. Kind of did both things. Like yeah. It, it kind of like pushes it down a little bit, but also throws like a, a tiny little layer of compost over the top. Mm -hmm. And we've got Lots of green coming up. Yeah, it's going to be so pretty. Uh, Snappy said, can't wait to see how all your vegetables do this year. It seems like a number of new homes have been built around your properties or have many of them been there and we just didn't notice. No, they have been built since we initially purchased our home. I don't think any house was in this subdivision. Mejia's went well, in like later. I think that the first a couple, the, I think one of the reasons that it looks like that is that we're, we're showing new perspectives that we didn't show before. Um, when we first bought that new property out there, the three and a half acres or whatever, we never, that was somebody else's property. So we never went out there to show what it True. looked like, but there yeah. were a couple of houses there. Those were built I, after Mejia's though. Yeah, but we never showed it. But I think True. that they were there. By the time we started working the land, You're I think right. that the two of those houses were already there. Right. But there's hard to remember one, the timeline. There's one new one going up currently. When we bought our house, which is six years ago, uh, May 1st was six years, I think. Yeah, or this is our sixth season. Mm -hmm. Five full years we've been here. No, it's when you go by seasons, if you count the first like season, we're actually in our like ninth season no. of making videos. Yeah. So 2014, if you consider that our first season of well, no, filming. No, buying this house. Oh, in this house. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you Never remember mind. what I was on a different track. Was that, that was six years because it was 2016, right? So yeah. So it's 2022. That's yeah. six. That's six years. So yeah. when we bought our house six years ago and moved in, uh, we knew a subdivision was going in. It just hadn't started yet. And I think it was that first winter or that first fall maybe. Yeah. Maybe it was the year after when he has built their house. That was the first house that went in. So we, you know, bought it knowing all of the activity was going to happen. So we've got the best neighbors. Like, I don't know how we ended up with all of them. Well, we've talked about how, best. like, we know them all and mm -hmm. we would, like, trust every single one of them with our children. Yeah. Like, if something went wrong mm -hmm. and we needed to be like, can you watch our kids, like... At a moment's notice, any we would single, feel comfortable with literally them. any of them. That surround our And that's saying a yeah. lot, too. When you can trust somebody with your kids. Yeah. Yeah, we understand that differently now yeah. than we did before. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Kathy said, wow, you've done a lot of work in this video. So many tomato plants. Looking forward to seeing the harvest. Will you be planting pumpkins this season? We are going to plant pumpkins far, far less than last year, which makes me excited. I don't know, like... I don't know what it is, but I get real excited about stuff and then I get real bored with stuff. Like I just, I, I just can't do the same thing from year to year. Like I can see us not growing dahlias one year just because I'm just really? sick of it. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm just done with that crop. I don't want to do it again for a couple of years because I want to try something new out. I can totally see that happening. Um, that and, uh, and I explained, I think in this morning's video that went out, so you may have seen it by the time this one uh, went up. I showed my uh, sketch for the area right near those tomato plants where the pumpkin vines will be going. Um, and they were just, I explained in that video how the pumpkins were the most tender crop we grew out there. We found ourselves having to turn the drip on two, three times a day to keep them happy during the hottest part of the summer. And I think the way we'll have them this year, they'll be a little more protected, which I think will help because it's gonna be a secret garden kind of closed in. They'll be a little more protected from the wind. Um, hopefully they don't dry out as quickly. I think over time, us adding more and more organic matter into the soil will help as well. But I just didn't want to go into another season having this crop that I'd look out midday and see the whole thing wilted. Mm -hmm. Like we'd look out there every single pumpkin plant like wilted to the ground. And then it takes them 24 hours after heavy watering to pick back up. And this is when they're still getting consistent water. I just didn't want to do that again this year. Um, so anyway, that and I wanted something different. Could they handle overhead water? 
Probably. I mean, they're an annual crop, so it's not like hard water is going to build up enough to hurt the plant. I wonder what the root system does. I like, think that'd be wasteful, though. Would it? Well, I think so, and I don't... I mean, just because you'll lose a lot to evaporation, you'll lose a lot just to runoff because it'll hit the leaves and go away from the roots of the plant instead yeah. of being concentrated at the roots. But do the roots stay in one place or well, do, they, do they spider out? I think they'll spider out a, a, not much, but a little bit, but I think you could get them to root in other areas and maybe uh, that's where we need to focus. Because we're only watering at right, the, at the right at the point of yeah. planting. And I wondered if that was why they wilted is that there wasn't like a coverage, like right. the whole area wasn't getting water. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think that if, uh, if they had a more moist bed underneath the whole thing, it would bring the, the temperature down, too, which would be helpful, um, and it might encourage them to root in other places where their stems are touching the ground. Yeah. So that could be a thing. We could be approaching it all wrong. I don't know. Maybe we should, we should research. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> nah. Uh, for me to see you said, hey, I noticed that the tomatoes you grew from seed were transplanted into proven winter eco pots. Just curious, did you plant the eco pots as well? Did they really break down and feed the plants throughout their growth cycle? No, I took them out of the pots. In fact, though some of those pots I had used the prior year to start some dahlias from seed, um, and I haven't noticed any kind of breakdown. And I don't think proven winters is going to actually go that like try to market them as. No, they're not. You know, they're going to encourage people to take plants out. I think in the beginning, maybe during testing, it, it was kind of hopeful that you could plant the whole thing in the ground because mm -hmm. it's, it allows you to skip a step. But they just don't break down fast enough, which is good in one way because at retail, it would be really hard, especially if you've got plants sitting there for a long time, to keep them happy and looking okay in these pots. If they break down too quickly, then, you know, you have to... Then you don't have a container anymore. Yeah, then you probably have to go find a plastic one to put them yeah. in, you know, which defeats the purpose. Um, so I think that the approach they're going with is like these will break. They're not plastic. They will break down over yeah. time, but they're not going to break down in a season. It's an eco-friendly pot. Right. It's not a pot that you can plant your plant in the ground in. Right. You know, the whole thing. Which I think was kind of the direction they were thinking to, of going in the yeah. beginning. And I it think just, everybody wants that just for the ease of just like yeah. throw the whole pot well, in the Well, you and I were like, oh man. That will yeah. save us so much time here in our, yeah. well, I mean, this year, maybe they'd break down quicker with the amount of water we're getting, yeah. but most years, you'd probably just pull them up in the fall and the pot would be 100% intact. But now they're saying, you know, put them on your compost pile or even, you know, if you just throw them in the trash, they'll break down in a landfill and just turn to dirt, mm -hmm. which is better than a, a plastic pot. Right. So it's good either yeah. way. Uh, Nancy said, looking so good. The shed looks great too. Thank you. I'm loving it. Not quite done yet. Half the roof is done and a little part on the front is done and I've got to pick out lights and it's been, the weather's been so crummy. I'm like, come on, <laughs> like, can you just clear up just long enough to get the rest of those shakes on that flower shed? Because then I, I'm kind of waiting until the outside's done until I move all my stuff in there because there's still some of the guy's supplies and I don't really want to put stuff in there that's getting in the way and or getting extra dirty. I just kind of want it buttoned up so I yeah. can clean and then set How everything. How come you haven't got lights yet? Well, I looked online last night for a oh, long time you? when the kids were taking a bath. I was, I was sitting next to the bathtub, like just scrolling, scrolling, looking at lights. And I just haven't found, I can see it. You guys do that ever? Like, I feel like that about the inside of our house too. I can see the kind of fabric I want for sure. Do you have days. a hard time um, knowing what things are called? Cause I, I encounter that when I'm yeah. searching for things mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not calling it the right thing. So when I'm searching, I'm just scrolling through the wrong things because then I finally figure out like, oh, it's called this. Yes. And once yeah. you type that in, you're like, oh yeah, there's all the ones that I was trying to search for but couldn't find. Well, it's like the Hartley stone. I needed snapped natural stone. Like how would I have known to call it snapped? Right. You know, I wanted natural stone that had been snapped, AKA cut, but roughly, yeah. you know. Anyway, yeah, that's definitely a uh, thing. And then sourcing, like finding the right sources. I feel yeah. like I lack the knowledge of mm. where to, to start looking for certain things. And like for that shed, it's very particular because the holes were made a little bit high. Um, so I need something that attaches and then hangs down from there. And it needs to be very narrow because there's not much space between the door and the window. I don't want barn lights. We have barn lights on our barn. and. I don't really want that look. I don't want it to look like farm style. I want it to look a little bit more colonial-ish, if that even makes sense for that shed. But with, you know what I mean. Cedar shakes. <laughs> <laughs> you know the colonial look. <laughs> well, and I don't want Edison bulbs. I don't want exposed unless it's candelabra looking, which they do have in carriage lights. They're like they look like a candelabra with the sleeve and then the real pretty bulb. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I'm being a little bit too particular. 
And I don't know what I was thinking with the first carriage lights that looked nautical. Yeah. You know, sometimes when you just get something on there, it kind of just doesn't even matter anymore. It's like you spend all this time thinking about getting the perfect thing, but then you just forget about it. You put something up and it, like you just, you never think about it again. Yeah, it's kind of true. Eddie and Trisha, they put a gold doorknob because it was the cheapest one. They just said we need, needed a way to get in and out easier until you pick one out. And I'm kind of like, I like that doorknob. <laughs> I don't mind it. Although I don't like knobs. Like I would replace every single knob for a, what are they? Just a handle, lever, I guess. Like a lever. Yeah, a lever. Because I always have my hands full and I have to have the ability to like throw my leg up yeah. or use my hip to open the door um, because I rarely have a free hand. Um, one question. Will the overspray from the grass sprinklers bother any of the plants in the beds, especially if the wind kicks up while the sprinklers are on? I know Laura always talks about the hard water deposits on the leaves, just wondering. That'll just have to be a Find out. wait and see kind of thing. The only thing I can see it, well, I don't even know. I mean, nothing stays up. I mean, even the raspberries are going to be cut back. There will be, I mean, the sprinklers right up against the raspberry beds. I would think that the thing that we'd see the most damage on would be like those black pots. The black wood would need to be restained probably once a season, maybe twice on the, the beds, which wouldn't be a bad thing to do as a maintenance thing anyway. Um, so yeah, it's just gonna have to be a wait and see sort of a situation. Melissa said, this is my first full year of gardening and my first time growing tomatoes from seed. That's super exciting. I have seen a few people say to pinch off the first blooms for larger tomatoes. Is this necessary? Do you pinch the first blooms? You know, I've honestly never heard that of people doing that. I don't do that. It might be beneficial. I don't know. I feel like there are a lot of people who are a lot more researched on a lot of gardening topics than I am because I'm just kind of a, let's just put it in the ground and see what it does kind of a girl. I don't know. I don't do a ton of, <clears throat> I learn by doing, yeah. I guess you could say. So, I mean, maybe it's something I should try doing, but no, I've never heard of it. I don't do it. I get crazy yields off our tomato plants. So take that for what it's worth. Lauren said, so I've been wondering what is the difference between soaker hoses and drip irrigation other than the obvious? When would you use uh, one over the other? Also, what did Paul and Aaron do with the mulch they scraped up? Um, so soaker hoses versus drip irrigation. So the obvious is that drip irrigation uh, has emitter holes every you know, six, nine, 12, 18 inches. You can get them in a ton of different spacing, yeah. emitter spacing. And then soaker hoses weep along they're supposed to weep along the whole surface of the soaker hose. And that's one of the reasons why we don't use soaker hoses because they're supposed to weep the distance and they just don't. They'll be like a dry patch and then they'll weep a little bit and then a dry patch. And they and all, never consistent. Never consistent. We tried it in our raised beds up here. Um, I used quarter inch soaker hoses and it worked okay like in the very beginning. And then it just like I'd notice plants wilting, but not the whole bed. Like the yeah. first part of the bed where the you know soaker was coming out would be great. And then the back half of it looked horrible. So I had a hose out all the time. And I found that the drip irrigation was much more consistent. So long as you follow the length or the, the run distance mm -hmm. guideline, you don't want to run it too far. Um, otherwise you'll run into some of the same issues. Also soaker hoses for us, and it could be different for other people in different climates, but the more they're exposed to the dry hot, they just break down. Like they just, like you could just, yeah do this and they just break apart. It's crazy. And then Paul and Aaron with the mulch they scraped up, they actually, so Aaron went through and kind of um, used a land plane, right? To kind of make a little road for us on the new property. Yeah. Um, so not the new property, but the new, the new, new property, <laughs> not the South garden, which we call it the South garden pretty much consistently now. Yeah. And so, so we, we have a new, pro so the new property is now the barren land property. Yeah. And it's the one, it, it makes our property an L shape now. So it attaches to the South garden. Anyway, uh, Aaron took his land plane and on the back of the tractor and kind of scraped up a road for us to get back to our, like our compost our pile. pile. Yeah. So they took that mulch and kind of sprinkled it on that um, roadway because it's real powdery there. And so it does help keep the dust down a bit. Next video, planting 11 different container combinations for sun and shade. So we were down at our local community college. We have probably two more days worth of projects to do there. I think we could probably get it all done in one. No way. Really? Oh my gosh. I have like 13, let's see. Well, isn't it just the four How or the many? eight quadrants plus the... Yeah, but I've got like, I want to say I've got like 1,300 plants for the fountain area. Whoa. Uh, I know. And then I've got a lot for the greenhouse area. That one will be fast. So, and then the one planter. The greenhouse and the planter are no big deal. The fountain area, I mean, based off of last year... 
Although they did bring in a bunch of soil and it looks like they fixed some issues that they were having. There was two quadrants or something that they were plugging and flooding. And so the plants, of course, didn't do really well there. And they had to have cones out for a lot of the season because yeah. it was just flooding everywhere. So Benny was down there and got that all handled. So it should be pretty easy planting. And, it, you know, there are perennials in there. So it's likely I may not use as many, which is okay because I still have a few pots around town I'm going to do. I'm going to do some pots at our church. I'm going to do some pots at... The relief nursery i still need to go do those it's just been such a weird spring i can't believe we're into june and still yeah. like thinking about planting pots but it is what it is uh fluffy said thank you for continuing this public gardening project gardening in public helps non-gardeners appreciate the beauty of plants i love public gardening and keep the large containers at my local library refreshed and maintained throughout the year anyone else do public gardening yeah that would be interesting to i would love to know what kind of projects you guys have done in your community and good job for taking care of the pots at your library. That's really a neat project. Stephanie said, I would love to see the behind the scenes of a project like this. Would you be willing to film a video showing how you organize and prepare for such a huge planting project like this? The f it's so spread out. Like the funny thing about it is I ordered the plants last fall. What, was it like November? Yeah, October? it seems like it's earlier and earlier every year. Yeah, I, I feel like it was done buttoned up in October or November. I knew, you know, I had all the plants sent to the grower or the, the list of plants that we needed for the project sent to the grower. And I did not look at that list until we got our first load of plants. I'm like, well, I got to figure out what's going to the college, yeah. what's going here, what's going there. And so I had to refresh my mind after all those months of what was going where. Um, and then we had things scheduled to come at different weeks so that we could get, you know, this project done and then get a fresh load of plants the next week and do the next set of projects, which some of them kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't receive some of the plants at I don't know. Or we did the projects out of order. Uh, it's really a weird thing. And then usually like the night before, I come out here with Benjamin after Samantha goes down for bed and we load up the trucks. So I like to take my time when nobody's here, nobody's out there. And Benjamin just has a great time. He's just messing around. And, um, and I just go through the list and really figure out what we're gonna do. And then we load the trucks up. Um, and so that the next morning, you know, Amy shows up and then we all load up and head down and get the job done. So that's pretty much how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. Monique said, I've noticed Proven Winners plants are coming in really small containers this year compared to what I've seen in previous years. Have you noticed it? Any insight into why? Is that true? Well, it shouldn't be true. That's the, so like, I don't know if it's just that garden center or, you know, where she's at, but um, they should all be coming in the white Proven Winners, Grande size, because that's what Proven Winners is requiring this year. But I did notice like at Home Depot, they're in like kind of different shaped containers? Yeah, I think Home Depot has like a proprietary shaped, you know, size uh -huh. that, that just they order. Um, but it's the same thing. It's just kind of like an oval shape. Instead and, and of it a it probably circle. just fits their, you know, their benches. Uh -huh. But yeah, they should be, should be. the normal size. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Give It A Go Garden said, really enjoyed the container arrangements you made. I think the cannas are also my fave. Yeah, that was the one thing that the gal at the college said that everybody loved the cannas that we used last year. And I used a lot, but it wasn't something I really focused on. So I thought this year I should make an effort to use more of those around if they really enjoyed them. Does the school have a drip line to all the containers or does Rosa have to hand water them all? What uh, Would that change the growing habits of the plants if she does? Uh, you know, right now the fountain area, the gym bed and the greenhouse bed are the only ones on drip, right? That we do all the in-ground plantings. All the in-ground plantings are on drip. She does come along though because they weren't ready. Like they needed to do some repair on the drip line, like in that front entryway that we planted. Um, she came behind us and watered everything in by hand, and she probably watered it by hand for a few days yeah. before Benny got got down there to get it all fixed and running. So she doesn't have to do any of the in-ground stuff. And I think the pots even at those entryways had drip running to them last year at mm -hmm. least. Uh, but all the other containers she does by hand. She has her gator and her water tank and she just, I would love that job. Yeah. That would just be like, oh, I would just be so relaxed and loving it. But she does an amazing job. They have it on a really good schedule and like whatever she's doing, I hope they just continue doing that forever. Yeah. <laughs> the last part of that question, would that change the growing habits of the plants if she does? So I think that the key is consistency. So, you know, it would, if everything was hand watered and they didn't have somebody as consistent as Rosa watering them, it's possible that things could look different because plants do thrive on consistency and consistency of fertilizing, um, which they do as well. So I feel like, you know, the schedule they, they have is really good. And if they veered from that, it could change things a bit. Yeah. 
It'd have to be a big beer, I think, because a lot of the plants we used are pretty darn tough, mm -hmm. and they're high-performing plants anyway, but they do just so much better, just with that consistency. Mary said, love the containers. Since they saved the begonias, do you know if they saved the cannas too? I don't know. She, she didn't say anything about that. It's also a lot of work. Yeah, it is it's a, a lot, lot of work. Of work. Uh, the amount of if you don't have the machinery to do it like in a field setting mm -hmm. you know you could do one or two and that's fine but when you're saving a hundred cannas it's not worth the time uh laura said but with your hot summers i wonder why you don't add some sort of mulch to conserve moisture on containers i well um they do come along with mulch in the in-ground areas right and mulch which is probably it's helpful. just not like what it's not something that we do no we never mulch around uh, we mulch well, our stuff. Yeah, in ground, but yeah. not containers. Yeah. We don't mulch Is that ground. a thing? Do do people... The thing, the plants just grow so quickly with the yeah. heat, and they just cover the surface anyway. Right. Like, there's never it any... It might help in the beginning. Yeah. But it's usually cooler in the beginning. Well, like, the think. second the heat hits, the plants just explode, and then you never see the soil. Right. So I don't, I don't think that um, there's that any do benefit to doing benefit. that. benefit. Just an extra step. Yeah. Um, Patricia said, I see you work with no gloves. How do you get your hands clean? I too work without gloves and it seems to take days to get all traces of the dirt gone. Yep, same. My hands are always in some state of permadirt and I have like one of those really stiff nail brushes and I go to town to where like my fingers are kind of like, like a little sore <laughs> from it and I still can't get it all, but it still doesn't make using gloves worth it to me. I just, I don't like it. I don't like it. You can't make me. <laughs> Lori said, who sees this all summer? Usually colleges are not in session. There's a lot of summer courses that go on there. There are um, like camps and workshops and stuff like that. There's also people touring, like potential students and stuff that come to tour or people that come to look at the, the campus. Um, so there's a, quite a bit of activity. In fact, my brother teaches during the summer um, down there. So anyway, I think a lot of people have been able to see it and enjoy it. But yeah, that is something that I kind of wondered at one point too. Yeah. Yeah. Next video is planting a gorgeous full sun container arrangement. So we planted up the urns on the west side. They are so pretty. I used unplugged pink salvia as a centerpiece and they're nice big plants. One of them snapped off in a windstorm. Oh, serious? I have an extra in the greenhouse, but so I'll take that one out and just regrow that one and put the bigger one in so they all match. I'm glad I saved it because I was, you know, usually with extra plants, I find homes for them, you know, pretty quickly because I don't want to take care of stuff in the greenhouse. But I hang, hung on to two extra of those unplugged pink. And after today, with all the like gusts that we're getting, I might have another one to replace anyway. Um, so unplugged pink salvia, diamond frost euphorbia, supertunia, raspberry rush, supertunia bordeaux, supertunia vista jazzberry. They're so pretty. And that was one of the first videos. Last week we tried um, two days. We did two videos per day, just shorter, because typically I would put those projects in one video, but we thought we would try seeing if you guys liked maybe shorter videos or easier to title for us, um, and we could still have them go out in the day. So collectively, it's the same amount of time usually that we would put a video, like a, the length of video would be the same, um, but just put out at different times, so it's a little bit easier to maybe digest. I don't know, a lot of you guys seem to enjoy it. There were a few of you who were like, well, I like the longer videos. But we always, there's always kind of a mixed bag. Um, anyway, yeah, so that was the project. NW said, Dear Laura and Erin, I want to thank you for always being a constant source of something beautiful. It has taken me a couple of days to allow myself to watch you again as I try, try to pull myself out of the pain felt by many earlier this week. Um, thank you for your videos, for those of us whose minds are constantly racing, and we need somebody that gives us joy to focus on. That's super, super sweet to hear because it's super hard at times to maintain. You know what mm. I mean? Like sometimes you want to, you want to talk about the things and it's not a bad thing to talk about the things that are going on that are horrible and sad and tragic. Um, but we try so hard to be consistent in, in gardening and beauty and trying to keep it a place where you guys can come and expect something to maybe relieve you a little bit. Cause that's important too. Um, it's important to have, to allow yourself to feel some comfort too in those times. So anyway, I was really happy to hear that comment. Um, Osiris, Os Osiris, Osiris, Osiris said, I have never gotten an answer from you. So may this, maybe <laughs> this will be the one. Can these flowers on this container, could they take a temp of 105 in some kind of shade? Looking forward to hear from you. I mean, they can take 105 for sure if they have consistent water, but they need sun in order to produce, to be productive plants. They need a minimum of six hours, all of them. 
Um, so, well, Diamond Frost, you can maybe get away with a little more shade. I do put that in shade containers on occasion, and it's more of a, a light accent plant than a really full robust plant in that case, but those are definite sun lovers, so they would need to get some rays. Lou and Christy said, love the salvia as your centerpiece. Just wondering about putting with supertunias and salvia together. Their water needs seem so different. Will that variety of salvia be okay with the same amount of water you need for supertunias? Be interested in how that container for, performs. Well, you never know. I don't have a ton of experience with unplugged pink, but I know like with plain the blue salvia, that plant needs consistent water or it wilts. Um, so I find in containers too, that tend to want to dry out a lot quicker because it's, they're just, there's not as much soil around them. You can get away with a lot of different pairings that maybe wouldn't do as well together in a flower bed situation um, where, you know, maybe one's getting too much water and not being as happy as the other one, but I, I think we'll be okay. Annual salvia is not the same as perennial salvia though, mm -hmm. right? Right. Well, yeah. I mean... I think annual salvia, it feels like it can, it wants the same amount of water generally as, as supertunias. Right. I find that they like in there, just like taking care of them in a container, like still in their container sort of situation. You can tell a lot from a plant based on how they do in containers and our salvia, perennial salvias in containers don't need to be watered nearly as much as our annual salvias in containers. So it could be that those annual salvias are just beast growers. They're mm -hmm. just big and they, they grow fast and so they utilize a lot more of it. That could be it too. Mm -hmm. But I'm hoping that that arrangement works well together because I think it's really pretty. Connor said, curious about the supertunias. You said you fertilize every week. What would they do if they weren't fertilized that often? Would they still look good or suffer? I think they would still probably look good. They just wouldn't get as big and as robust as they would with consistent fertilization. There have been some years where we just have not, we haven't made it to the mm -hmm. every week fertilization. We do add a slow release fertilizer into the soil and I think that that's a really good plan B kind of situation um, because if you don't get to the consistency every week with water soluble, at least you have something in there. Um, but yeah, I feel like our plants did, did okay, maybe not like. Well, a year or two ago, we tried um, using the Espoma flower tone, mm -hmm. kind of instead of the, and then we learned really quickly that um, our, our plants just don't take up iron. Yeah. And the flower tone doesn't have the EDDHA iron in right. it. So. Proven you know, Winter's Water Soluble does have the EDDHA yeah. iron, which helps keep the leaves really uh, nice and deep green. Yeah, which everything turns. And if, if the leans, leaves are not taking up iron and they're turning yellow, the plant is effectively starting to die because it's not- Getting it's what not, it needs. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not um, photosynthesized. photosynthesized. Yeah. yeah, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> Uh, Rhonda said, do you deadhead your salvia? I typically don't, um, not even with playing the blues and the calyx on those aren't as dark as the calyx on this unplugged pink. So the calyx is the little thing that holds the bloom to the stem. So you've got your stem, you've got like the little thing that the bloom goes inside kind of and comes out of. So the calyx is this dark burgundy color and it's kind of shiny, it's really pretty. And that's one of the features of the plant is that when those blooms, the bright pink blooms dry up and fall off, you're still left with a beautiful calyx that kind of looks like a bloom, just a different color. I love that. Evergreen said, do you not have flying biting bugs like mosquitoes and black flies? I guess not with the desert environment. Here in Maine, you would definitely be wearing a bug net to make a video. You know what, it's weird because usually we have mosquitoes like crazy. Have not seen a, well, I've seen a mosquito, maybe two mosquitoes this year. Yeah, not a lot though. Not a lot yet, no, and like nobody's been spraying or anything, it's just been so cool. And I don't yeah. know if that's helping us out here, but yeah, not a problem yet. Some years are way worse than others. Do you remember it was like the second year we were here? No, it was the year Benjamin was, mm -hmm. um, he was over a year, so it was like 2019. That was like the year of the mosquito, it was horrible, and they love Benjamin, and he just constantly, even with, we tried all kinds of different things, and he just attracts yeah. the mosquitoes. So as long as he's nearby, they never bug me. Yeah. It's kind of like my mom, they are attracted to my mom too. Monique said, I know it's not a problem you have, but how would you suggest weekly fertilizing when you live in an area where you get a ton of rain? Do you just sprinkle water soluble fertilizer on top of your container plant soil and let mother nature water it in? Or is there another type of fertilizer method you would recommend? Yeah, you could do like the flower tone approach as long as they don't need the iron. Yeah. Um, if they if they do a lot of yellowing, but they might be yellowing from too much too moisture much too. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. a tough one. I've actually never thought about that. Like if you get enough rain to keep your planters happy, number one, I'm jealous of that. Um, but yeah, that would make fertilizing a little bit. So maybe like the continuous release that you add in the soil, I would definitely do that. 
and reapply every six weeks. And at least you'll have some food in there. I think that I would try that approach. Dang. Man, it is just like, there will be trees that fall down. Yeah, there will. Maybe not in our yard, but somewhere here in town. Why do we live in a place where trees fall down? Next video was planting colorful perennial phlox and Veronica. So I had some luminary backlight phlox, bright white, beautiful phlox, and a new Veronica called uh, Magic Show Ever After. A real pretty purple one, like lavender purple, planted both on the west side, and I think they look pretty, really pretty. And that was the second video we put out the same day as the urn video. That was kind of fun. So Laura said two videos in one day. Thank you. Beautiful plants. Can't wait to see how your entire garden will transform. I know it won't disappoint. I can honestly watch you guys all day have a beautiful weekend thank you that's so so sweet i'm really happy with how things are coming on that west side i think we'll have it filled up in no time i'm kind of like holding back a little bit i do have some fall blooming purple asters that i want to put in there i want to make sure that i'm not focusing on all the things that look pretty right now it'd be really easy to do that and just fill it full of early summer interest i think that's what you do though is like uh in spring you you know you put in things that are spring blooming mm -hmm. uh and then in summer you start to do more of that and i know then the but fall, you have to save you do, space yeah and then the fall you go in with your shrubs like your flowering shrubs mm -hmm. that because those are the ones that are blooming and so you start planting those well i was thinking about like i need to make sure budlia makes it in there i need to have some smaller butterfly bushes yeah. in there that have really amazing color a lot of echinacea we need still tons of space though well, I feel like it's getting less and less, though, the more yeah. we plant. So I got to be mindful of that. Uh, Judy said, looks so beautiful. What do your, uh, why do your arborvitas not grow in a tighter formation? Maybe we should have planted them a little closer together. Maybe. I, I think that they will eventually fill in, but I do think we could have put them maybe like six inches closer. Yeah. But I do think maybe that they weren't. Maybe four inches closer. I, I don't think they were pruned properly at the grower either. Yeah. Um, so arborvitas that you want to have really tight and skinny, they'll naturally form several liters. And if you don't uh, prune them properly and let one liter be the star or, the, or let it be the leader, then you'll end up with, I mean, you've probably seen hedges of arbs that just look like one plant has six different tops kind mm -hmm. of. Um, and that's because it wasn't selectively pruned. And it's funny because we did lose a couple of our initial uh, arbs that we planted and we put new ones in from a different year, I think, or a different, like way later that season from a different grower and that one had been pruned properly. Mm -hmm. So that one is like pointy and perfect and way taller than the other ones. Yeah. Um, but you know what? It's probably a good thing that these weren't pruned properly because I think they'll be, they'll, they will be thicker yeah. in the end than ones that are just pointy. So maybe that, was, that all worked out. Lola Fiona said, when the trees get bigger, will this become more shaded? Yep, and it already has become more shaded and I, I'm excited for that day. Um, it'll be a while though. It's, you know, all newer gardens or baby gardens that aren't mature start out as full sun gardens. And then as things get bigger and more mature, you kind of have to start digging things out and moving them to more sun and putting more shade lovers in. Otherwise, I mean, you'd end up with a, if you planted a tree and knew that one day it would be shaded and never planted anything underneath it, it takes years to get it to that stage. And you miss out on so much joy and so much color if you decide to just wait to plant stuff until it gets to that point mm -hmm. that you want it to get to eventually. Uh, but I'm kind of of the mindset, I mean, you guys know, I like to pack containers full. I like to like just fill up spaces and make them pretty now. Mm -hmm. And I will deal with the d uh, digging stuff out and moving them later. And that's kind of how I like to do it. Susan said, absolutely gorgeous. Question, I added miracle Grow, a shake and feed and some biotone in my containers. Is that okay? Hope it's not too much. I probably okay. I don't know a lot about miracle Grow shake and feed, but Biotone is an organic, very slow release. Um, I, I mean, probably wouldn't make a habit of doing that all the time. No, but probably not. Probably okay. Yeah. Canadian girl said, I heard that the foxglove plant was very poisonous to cats and dogs. I was given a few little foxglove plants. How do you keep your cats from eating them? Yeah, foxglove are poisonous. I, I think animals have, I mean, my cats don't go around and eat stuff. I mean, maybe some grasses here or there I see them eating on but they just don't tend to mess with things. And I think animals know. How long did you work at the vet? Oh, five and a half years. I think like the most telling thing is that you never, in five and a half years, you were the receptionist. So you saw everything that yeah. came, came uh -huh. and went. <clears throat> in that time, you never saw an animal eat a poisonous plant and come in for that. Never. So never. I just don't think it's, it's like splitting hairs. I just don't think it's a 
pro that's a problem I think people think it's going to be. Well, like I think lilies are a big thing. Like really? the lilies that have a lot of pollen because I, they are very, very poisonous and they, they, like I planted lilies out in the cut flower garden and not to say that it can't happen because it does and that's why people know about it, but um, like if a cat just walks by and gets pollen on its fur and then licks itself to clean itself, mm. like that's enough to like be fatal, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but I never saw anything like that. I think the only thing that we had in five and a half years, and this is a busy vet clinic, like booked out for a long time. So hard to get into that, that clinic. Um, the only emergency we ever had was like a chocolate overdose, <laughs> <laughs> a dog that got into like a bag of chocolate, um, but never anything plant related. Never. Wow. Got porcupine quills a few times and some pretty interesting, yeah. interesting things, but never uh, plant related. Uh, Aussie said, Laura, are you concerned about the arbs and them having multi trunks? They look to be opening up a little bit. Is there any way of correcting that? We did talk to um, the grower, not the one grower that they came from, but um, like our connection at Proven Winners who like breeds and you know, very knowledgeable. She said that we should just go along and make um, cuts, not a lot and very selective cuts to kind of try to start forming them and you've been doing that a bit yeah a little bit yeah so here, here and there. there over time we're hoping not to shock the plant or cut too much you're not supposed to make big deep woody cuts in these plants not a lot of them anyway so if we can over time kind of start correcting that a little bit mm -hmm. they might take on a little bit of a different shape but yeah I've, I've noticed that too patty said how about caladiums in front of the urns we could do that you know i am on the fence about caladiums and i think this year is probably the Is weather. Is she asking about the ones that you did plant or the ones that you could plant? The ones I could plant in front oh. of the urns is some kind of a lower, more bold kind of texture. Sure. Um, one, I don't want to plant anything else I have to dig up in there. I have to really like it in order to want to dig it up. Um, caladiums, where we're at, they need a consistent soil temperature of like 60. Mm -hmm. Like it needs to be high or not soil temperature. It needs to be like a nighttime temperature. Like it needs to be a consistent high temperature. We're still getting nights in the low 40s. I planted those two back urns with the caladiums. We brought them into the sun porch or the shade porch right above where they were planted and they bit it. Mm -hmm. Those two caladiums, they might grow back, but they were protected uh, from some of the cooler nights that were in the 40s and they still did not perform. I, the ones at the college, I bet you anything we'll have to pull those. I texted uh, them about that. I said, hey, by the way, if those caladiums bite yeah. it, it's not your fault. It's yeah. just, and I think this year has been- Atypical. Atypical too. <laughs> yeah. And so like, we're, you know, we're noticing it more because it, like it's so cool for so it late really now. It really is. But, but still, I think that caladiums in our area is just not practical. It really is. And I think Southern Gardens, it's a better idea. Um, just because for us, if you want to save a spot for a caladium, you can't plant it until way after you're done. You know, a lot of people button up all their plantings in May and then they just get go into like care mode and maintain mode. Yeah. Um, and if you can't plant until sometime in June, it's like the interest kind of meh, yeah. like, and then they, you know, the first whiff of cold in the fall, mm -hmm. they're done. It's such a short season for us. I have some I'm trying to grow in the greenhouse right now. I've got them on a heat mat, like trying to provide a lot of extra heat, but it's just the ambient temperature is so chilly, yeah. um, which I'm not complaining about. Like. I don't care. Like, I don't really care about having to grow caladiums all that much. I mean, there, there's a lot of really pretty ones and I will still probably try to grow them because it's, it's fun just to try new things, but it's one of those things that I can, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine that we can't. Next video is planting large full sun containers. So the two big black square pots at the entrance of our cut flower garden planted those up. I love the mix of plants so far. They're looking really good. And I did give you a little tour of the flower shed out there, kind of the state of the union at the moment. Uh, Sandra said, I thought about the black containers. Do you think a coat of wax would prevent the hard water stains? It would be worth It'd a work. shot. Yeah. Yeah. Good suggestion. Tribe of Travis said, will the overhead water from the grass sprinklers mess with the plants that are also being watered by drip? What plants would handle both well? Well, we will see what handles it well. The, the thing about it, all the drip run, like all the drip tape that we run, uh, we have a valve on the end of it. So I did run, we just finished the infrastructure setup of like that uh, arbor maze kind of area we're gonna plant up. And I did run a, a 
row of drip right next to where the grass is being grown. And I did notice that soil is wet and I just have the valve off because I don't think I'll plant seeds in there. And I don't think I'll ever have to actually run drip to them. So if yeah. we just keep that in mind and just monitor that so that things aren't getting over water, they'll be fine with the grass water mm -hmm. so long as they're not getting water on top of that. Elena said, question, does your sister have a nice garden like your mom's? Well, it's interesting. My sister's interest lies in cooking. She loves to cook. She loves to meal plan, prep, all of that kind of stuff, try out new recipes. She's not as much into gardening as my mom and myself. Um, she does work for my parents at their garden center since she and her husband have been home. They did move around a lot for um, Nick's job. So now that they've been back in the area, they're actually currently building a home right now where she can have a little space to do some gardening. But up to this point, she's just container gardened um, and she likes to grow hot peppers. That's her jam. So I think she's got 12 or 14, 16, something like yeah. that. There's an, odd, or an even number in there, I think. Different varieties of hot peppers that she started from seed. She, I let her borrow one of our grow light systems that went to her house for a little while so she could do that. And um, anyway, yeah, she's good at gardening. I try to get her to work here for us. <laughs> I'm like, please come here and work. It would be awesome. Ah, she has too much loyalty to my parents' garden center. Spoiled said, where do you get the obelisks? Are they steel? Do you have anchors? They are not anchored, but they have long, feet, I guess. And they were uh, handmade locally. Uh, my parents' garden center, it's, uh, they get several like artisans that come and set their stuff out of their truck and just, like, my parents just buy straight off their truck. And that was one of those sort of deals. So I don't even know like what the guy's name is, but they are heavy. They're heavy metal. Uh, next comment, what are you going to use the shed for? I must have missed that, just a getaway? No, the shed is actually going to, well, it'll be kind of a getaway a little bit. It's a place out there since we're out in the cut flower garden so much in the season. Um, there's going to be work tables in there. I'm going to have, I actually already have the um, hutches that I can store a bunch of vases in. I'll have buckets, the tools we use out there most often. Um, we'll have all of the supplies, like so we don't have to go back and forth from the barn. I want to be able to make most of our cut flower arrangements out there. I usually haul everything in. Well, I've hauled it in here or the greenhouse or the kitchen, um, but that'll be our, kind of like the designated area. We'll probably use it for filming, um, for sorting through harvests and stuff that some are a little bit more protected than just out in the sun. It would be nice. I was actually just thinking last night, I wonder how much it costs to run like a small cooler, like a, like a drink cooler, you know, that you see at gas stations, like oh, a small yeah. one. Um, that you could like keep harvest until you could deliver them or keep oh. flower buckets or whatever because it would allow you to keep the harvest fresher if you were able to do it. That's my problem right now is like getting out there and getting the harvest done and getting them delivered right, right away. Because um, you have to do it like early, early, You have to early do it early morning. and then you want to deliver it when it's the freshest. You don't want it to sit for even a couple of hours if yeah. possible, especially for some things like greens and peas and things like that. Like you want to get them and peppers, you want to have them chilled and then you can take them. So that's something I'll probably look into. Yeah. That would be nice to have out there. Uh, Samantha Moore said, what do you do with the bulbs that were in those containers in the spring? Do you plant on top of the bulbs? Those actually went to a friend's house. <laughs> I, was, I was going to plant them in the ground, but it's just been so busy. They were done, finished. We enjoyed the heck out of them. And then they went, they went to a friend's. Ruth said, are you going to have screens for your windows? Love the containers uh, and flowers. No, because I'll probably have the doors flung open. I'll have, I don't know. I mean, there's a little, little window in the season where flies are kind of bad. So I don't know what that's gonna be like in there, but. You keep a vacuum out there. Yeah, yeah. I'm not too worried about it. In fact, we bought bug screens for the Hartley and yeah. they, they were, uh, and then we got to thinking about it and like the louvered windows up top, like those are going to be open. The doors are going to be open a lot. Yeah. And then we got to thinking about how like that probably was. It's a bad decision. Kind of a waste a little bit that we ordered those. And then they did make the windows look not as clean. They were expensive too. They were expensive. I know. But you know, Paul's dad's using them in a project. Yes. Yeah. So they went to a new home. They're being used in a structure. So it's awesome. Fanny said, do you get to approve the ads that are placed on your video? Don't appreciate the Disney ad. We do not have any control over the ads. I... You do though, right? They Viewers do. They can curate the ads, Yeah, right? I think you can, I think there's like the three dots and you can say like, I don't like this ad or something, mm -hmm. but like, it would be the most horrible thing if YouTube allowed creators to curate the ads. Mm. Because can you imagine like, if they put us in control, because then all of a sudden we become the bad guy. You know, if we're choosing what ads do and don't get played, 
Oh, oh man, though, during any kind of election, though, that was horrid. Because yeah. they would they would play ads for both sides. Yeah. And, and you get complaints for both, yeah. side by side, those comments. Yes. Oh, I can't believe this ad. I can't believe that ad. And we never talk about that. We don't talk about those sorts of things. We try yeah. to keep this place free of all of that kind of yeah. stuff. And not that we don't have opinions or, you know, the, the way that we like things and that sort of thing. But, yeah, so we got all kinds of ads that we have no control over what's shown. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of local political ads too, you yeah. know, in, in like your local area could be, you know, like a, you know, mayor, or, mm -hmm. you know, senator or whatever right. running. But yeah, I really hope that YouTube never puts that because right now YouTube is like the bad guy for them choosing what ads they, you know, do and don't allow. And that's great. I want the blame to be on them. <laughs> if they ever shift that to the creators... It, you know, it's just going to create more division because then you're going to have creators that allow these or that ads or whatever, and, and then, then we become the bad people. For... And then their audience would become an echo chamber. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not good, and we just need less division. Yeah. Agreed. This might be, nope, we've got two more videos. My <laughs> goodness, okay. Planting the most beautiful clematis and salvia was the next video, and I planted more pink perfusion salvia, which is one of my favorite pink perennial salvias out there, and then a clematis that... It's called Still Waters. You guys, I've never had a clematis in a container look as gorgeous as this clematis does. And I, I can see it. It's kind of protected by the arbs, thankfully, during this windstorm. Just the most gorgeous periwinkle blue flowers, big flowers, and I'm just so excited about it. Karen said, this is my lucky day. Not one, but two incredible videos on a Saturday. The color blocking looks so impactful and stunning. That lawn area is so perfect for a blanket and picnic basket. I often had picnics with my three ki kids. They still talk about the happy happiness they experienced. Benjamin is big in picnics. is what yeah, he calls picnics. them. Picnics. Is that for something? Is that for our picnic? Yeah. He loves to get the... Actually, the quilt we use is one I sewed when I was... I don't know, 10, 11. I've sewed three quilts in my life. One of them was really intense and it was hard to do and I did not enjoy that at all. This one, I picked out like, I don't know, six or seven different colors of checked material. It's like, like red and white check and purple and white check. And then I picked out a material that has big slices of watermelon and one has, I don't, it's just like the most happy, fun quilt ever. And my mom made endless fun of me because I wanted the thickest, um, what's the inner batting yeah. the inner stuff i wanted the thickest stuff possible because i wanted it to be a picnic blanket and i wanted it to be really cushy and so like it stood out straight for a long time until we had washed it enough to where it had some flex but it's the best picnic blanket ever and i can't picnic. believe my kids are out there like using it and yeah. sitting on it it's so awesome uh but yeah picnics are a big deal farheen said do you ever plant annual vinca uh, no the only vinca, vinca i've planted is perennial vinca Perennial here anyway. Mm. Uh, Teffy Blood said, could it be Rogucci? Rogucci clematis? I think that's right. I Googled it and that name kind of rings a bell anyway. And that's probably why I don't remember it because it's a little bit of an oddball name. But I think that is the variety of clematis that I have on the other side of the fence. Uh, and I noticed yesterday the colettes, which they're just getting beat to smithereens today. Mm. Just worse. They're not in full bloom yet, but the blooms that are on them will probably be on the ground today. Um, but I noticed that clematis has made it up part of the arbor. Mm. That's exactly what I want on both sides. I want the clematis and the roses to kind of intermingle and so you see both colors. Uh, Kathleen said, I've just started watching you recently and I'm constantly amazed at the beauty of your gardening. Is this your home or is it a business? It is oh. both. <laughs> it is our home and our business. Rob's Garden Guide said, why is it clematis? We say clematis. I cannot say clematis. It's, it feels wrong. I know that's proper, but our region, we say clematis. We say uh, peony, which I have crossed over to peony. Mm. Uh, arborvita instead of arborvitae. Poinsettia instead of poinsettia. Um, yeah. Regional. Regional. As Stephen said, you haven't mentioned the watering or rather the startup of the irrigation this spring or all the zones on. What's new this year? Have you decided how you're going to fill the areas by the sun porch? Will you be adding Japanese maples or uh, perhaps larger trees like multi-stem lilacs or smaller birch? Irrigation, everything's on and has been for... It hasn't been, um, it wasn't like a push this year because no. it's been so cool. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've got the system off. It's been off for a little while because we're getting so much moisture. I'll turn it back on when things dry out, but mm -hmm. um, it's just been like glorious this mm -hmm. spring. 
uh, hasn't been, we've just been doing more of the same, but yeah. everything's, everything's, it's not functional. technically on now. We've had it on, mm -hmm. but I've been just like turning it on when it gets, when things dry out and then shutting it off whenever we get moisture, which has been a lot, mm -hmm. which has been great. Yeah. Um, and have you decided how you're going to fill the areas by the sun porch? Not 100%. I'm waiting on, I think I want to put a fountain in that bigger flower bed in front of the, the sun porch and getting things is a little bit difficult. So yeah, we just need to, we were trying to get it directly through unique stone mm -hmm. and that kind of fell apart. So I think we just need to order it through your mom. Yeah, maybe. Um, Anyway, we're not in a hurry really for anything. I don't have any solid plans on either of the big flower beds in front of our house, the one by the blue spruce and the one in front of the sun porch. They're just gonna have to fill in kind of naturally. I do need to reshape the flower bed on the other side of the brick walkway though. So there's the brick walkway that leads, leads up to the sun porch and we've got like the big area that I need to plant. And then we just did like a three foot wide flower bed last year and I do need to come in. We're gonna make it much wider and much more dimension in that area. And then we'll start adding trees to the grass grassy spots. This is the last video for this, for this, for this video. Uh, planting zinnias and maple trees and plans for the pumpkin vine area. So I planted up 20, well I didn't plant up all 26 varieties of zinnias in this video because we didn't quite have enough time, but I did plant a lot of them. Aaron planted four red point maples along our back fence line behind the orchard and I love that. So he was working on that while I was working on zinnias, while Paul was working on the T posts and paneling in our pumpkin vine area. And then I showed you my sketch for that space and what we're kind of hoping to attain. Uh, and I was hoping to plant that two days ago, but we'll get it planted this week. Ashley said, love your early upload times. Perfect for enjoying a cup of coffee on my back porch, listening to the birds and you. Love your channel. It gives me so much inspiration for my own garden. That's so awesome. And that's the goal for us, right? Like our goal is to inspire you and hopefully like give you a little bit of knowledge along the way as we are learning stuff. <laughs> You know, Connie's and RN said, did Aaron use any biotone with the tree planting? I think I got biotone in two of the holes. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Aaron? Well, I just, you know, I'm not usually the one planting and I missed it on a couple of them, I think. They'll be fine. Janet said, those maples that Aaron planted look really close to the fence. I know you know what you're doing, but could you perhaps tell us why they are so close to the fence? Thanks, love to watch the whole place coming together so beautifully. Uh. We, we didn't want them to impede uh, the drive, like the gravel that's back there. And so I asked our neighbor if he was okay with me planting them kind of like right on the fence. I don't think that they'll grow uh, big enough to where they'll actually touch the fence. Cause I was kind of looking at it and they're maybe like this far away from the fence. That'd have to be a big one. That'd be like a massive tree. And these maples don't get that big. Mm -hmm. They get like 45 feet tall. Mm -hmm. um, and how wide? 30 to 35. Yeah. yeah, but the trunk just doesn't get that big. So like it'll get close to the fence, but it'll never touch it. And our neighbor was totally fine with us putting it like on our property, but it'll hang over his mm -hmm. as well. Which we'll make sure. You kind of showed in the video how it's just kind of like undeveloped and they're yeah. not going to mess with it. Um, in fact, I'm not so sure that they wouldn't have gone ahead and finished their line of um, right. lindens right there. And they're probably like, yes, <laughs> they yeah. want trees there and we don't right. have to take care of them. They like trees too. They so do. yeah, he was totally cool with it. Yeah. Uh, Brian and Tammy, where do you get most of our, all of your Xenia seeds? So I got them from a few different places. The California Giants I get in the bulk bins down at my parents' garden center and I pick up any kind of fun new varieties they may get in. I got some from Swallowtail. Is it Swallowtail? I think gardens or Swallowtail seeds. You get very few seeds per packet, but there was some really fun varieties that I wanted to try. I get a lot from Johnny's because their selection is amazing and you get a ton for the, the price. And the information, I, I think that's the thing. You get these packets sent to you that are like white packets with print. There's no picture on them, but I don't even care. I don't need the picture. I love all the information they give on the back of their packets. It's where I've learned a lot about seed starting and all that sort of thing. And then while wow, that's a lot of land and sea in that gator, how would one acquire so much? I'm lucky if I can get a hold of one bag. Love your property so much, you give so many um, people the inspiration to try. Well, we do work with Espoma. Uh, my parents' garden center does carry it as well. So there's two easy ways for us to get our hands on it. Um, and they initially started sending it to us like three years ago when they were just trying it out and we were like, what is in this? <laughs> what yeah. is in this? I mean, I tried it in our raised beds and like our yields and I don't know. I think that it's more of like an acidic based compost. And our plants just gobble it up. Yeah, just, they just yeah. love it. Um, so, you know, I would check with your local garden center. I know they're working on distribution over here on the West Coast. It's uh, much more, I think, easy to get a hold of on the East Coast because that's where they're based from. 
Um, so I think they are continually working on that. Um, yeah. Sometimes you can get it drop shipped too. I don't know if that's something you can get through. Like we've had seed starting mix drop shipped yeah. to True Value. Best thing to do would be to go onto Espoma's website, find a local place, and then ask them if they can order it in. Because huh. like they may order in a few pallets of it. Yeah. Um, if they know there's some interest. Because mm -hmm. like they, you know, places that stock Espoma, you know, they regularly maybe I don't know. It depends on how much they go through, but mm -hmm. I would imagine that most places probably get like two to four loads at least a year. Mm -hmm. Um, so you may be only a couple months out from their next load. I was so happy when my parents' garden center was able to get it because I think for a while, like it, it, there's a lot of red tape in Oregon, I think, to get certain things in. Well, I think at the very beginning it wasn't registered in Oregon, mm -hmm. and so they couldn't get it. Um, but, of course, we live on the border of Idaho, so it's really easy for us to access things. Through, yeah. Um, but, yeah, they've got ton of raised bed mix now down at the garden center and land and scenes. It's nice. Slevin said, is it just me or Aaron seems like the practical one? <laughs> His ideas always make more sense than Laura's. I always find myself asking why on Laura's collapsible projects. <laughs> uh, I saw that comment and I wanted to throw it in there. <laughs> <laughs> That's baloney. <laughs> you gotta have a dreamer, right? Do you think I'm, pr I'm pretty practical? You are the infrastructure man. Yeah, I'm, I'm practical. I get bored too easy. That's why I do collapsible projects. I want to do like fun, interesting new things. I don't want to just plant all the pumpkins every single year. Yeah. You know, I want to do things that make me excited and I make think, me feel joy. Okay, I think that makes you fun because I was thinking about that the other day about some project that I could tell was very temporary. And you put a lot of effort into very temporary projects. But that's what makes you fun is like you put you put effort where others won't and that makes you interesting and like kind of a person that like you want to be around because practical people can be dull you know because they're practical yeah but you're a dreamer too though like you're practical in that you think through all of the details that would make your life easier in the long run in terms of the infrastructure but what makes you fun is you don't think through the details and you just run headlong into things and that makes you uh, like that makes you fun to be around People who think through all the problems ahead of time, it's, it's just, it's very boring. I, like when I do a project, it usually works because I've thought through everything, but I, it's also just really like. You know where I, I picked know. up, I think I got the most confidence. I picked up my confidence when I worked down at the garden center. Uh, I used to be a lot more tentative. I remember when we moved into our first apartment and I was so nervous about what plants to pick out for mm. that tiny little flower bed. It was like eight feet by yeah. like two feet a little and raised I was bed like, area no just the one in front of the front window i remember being oh. so stressed about am i going to pick the right colors am i going to pick the right thing is it you know and it was like a big deal and i think it took oh you know over time working at the garden center we just we we did a lot of stuff in terms of um merchandising and I, my mom was always like whatever ideas you have we'll just figure it out mm. and somehow it always worked out. You want to hang a bicycle from the ceiling for a display? We'll do it. Yeah. You want to create, you know, whatever? Like, we'll figure it out. We'll just get it, we'll yeah. get it done. And we did, and you, fi you figure out things along the way. You don't think through the details <laughs> beforehand, otherwise it makes the project not fun for me. Yeah. If I thought through all the details, it would shut me down so fast. In fact, when Aaron wants to talk about like any kind of like definite plans for like, show me where you want trees, show me where you want the tree placement. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. And you're making me not care. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I want to go pick out the pretty tree and I just want to carry it out into the grass and plunk it where it feels well, good. Well, you'll at the say moment. like, well, we could do a grouping of three trees here. And I'm like, well, show me, show me where all three would go. Like exactly. Cause I don't like, if I don't think it would work or something, I'm like, can you just point to the exact locations where that, it would in fit? In that statement, <laughs> I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> you know, for people watching, you should read the book, The Five Voices. I learned a lot about how, you haven't read it. No. But I learned about how we communicate <laughs> uh -huh. and the different voices that we have. I'll read like, it. Do we have the book? Well, yeah, but it's on um, Audible. Oh. I don't actually have the physical copy of the book. But um, I learned that I have like a defender voice where I will, if there's an idea, I'll poke holes at it. Not because I want it to fail, but because I want to know what the, you know, where it might fail mm -hmm. and then patch those things to where it actually succeeds. But as a creative, you kind of look at that as like, I'm trying to ruin it because I'm trying to find all the ways that it could fail. And you just see that as like, oh, you never like any of my ideas. Yeah, let the holes happen and we'll fix them as we go. Yeah, we'll you're more of like, a, like, I'll just jump and build the parachute on the way down, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, ah, oh, yeah. 
<laughs> can't do that. It's a good blend, honestly. Like we are yeah, so you need different. Both. And that's what you learn by reading the book is that you really need like in a in a business setting especially, you really need a lot of different voices because if yeah. you have too much of the same thing, mm -hmm. you don't get stuff done. I feel like we have such a good blend here too though. You know, Paul working here, he's such a like I don't know, I feel like everybody communicates really well with each other and um yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's a really good mix. Mix. Yeah. We also took a personality test recently. Yeah. That Sixteen personalities. Is it like the what's the name? I think it's Your just sixteenpersonalities.com, right? Yeah, and ours turned out to be the two most compatible. Yeah, one of the most compatible. One of the I most think. compatible. I thought it was going to be incompatible, and I was actually surprised to see that it's compatible. Why were you thinking? Well, because it was... it's we're so different. Yeah. But I think that's what makes us compatible is that we're not the same, mm -hmm. and. We do, I, you know, I mean, we've been married 15, almost, 16 years yeah. now. Yeah, 15 so, and a half, almost 16. That's a good run, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good run so far. Yeah. Okay, I don't know how we, oh, yeah, yeah, because of that comment. Okay, Karen said, have you tried using landscape staples to tack down the drip tape? You probably wouldn't need very many in a row. Yes, we have, and it does not work. We do one, so I pull the drip tape. I don't pull it too tight but I pull it to where it's all straight and then we use a landscape staple which goes right in between like a little ridge in the ender and it really helps poke it down and it's that stays put a lot of the time and then we'll tack it like every eight feet and the stuff still gets all over the place. So far the bricks have been the very best thing um, that we have used and they all have been landscape stapled down as well. So. I don't know, we'll see if the bricks hold up over time. And last comment from Janelle said, good morning, just wondering if you guys created business slash working hours for yourselves. I wish. With creating content, when do you get to enjoy your garden? Love, enjoy, and appreciate the content, by the way. I think having kids has been the great equalizer or the great uh, balancer. Yeah, it really has. Mm -hmm. Because you just can't get work done at a certain point. <laughs> no, when you don't have help to watch them. Yeah. Um, I, th I thought when we had Benjamin that I'd be able to strap him on and just keep on going at the same pace. I was so, so wrong about that. You can work with him now. He asks a million questions. He is which inquisitive. Is, he, it's cute. You know, he's so and, smart though and he remembers things and yeah. he's interested in really fun stuff. He's super interested in weather patterns. Yeah. He's super interested, like he, during this video, um, when I was out there, I told him I was gonna probably plant corn. I was hoping to that day. And he came and checked with me multiple times. When are you gonna plant the corn seeds? Have you planted the corn seeds? I wanna help with the corn seeds. I told him, dude, yeah. I will tell you when I'm getting ready to plant the corn seeds and I will make sure you're out here with me. Um, but yeah, he's, he's, very, he's very helpful. It's now. tough because it's it's really easy to want to brush them aside when you're wanting to get something done quick, mm -hmm. or if some, especially if something's not going correctly, because you're like, oh, this isn't going the way I thought, and you're trying to use the brain power to think of yeah. how to get a project done. Um, but then you have to but, step back and realize, like, we're his world, like, yeah, you know what I mean? Right. And the way we we interact with him and include him, like, that shapes his yeah, his, exactly his self yeah. <laughs> it shapes him and it's like yeah. it's worth it to take the time to explain what you're mm -hmm. doing and he'll retain that kind of stuff and he and, eats it up like yeah. that's his his time like that's that's his love language is right. time spending time with him in that capacity or like like last night we did a puzzle together he loves to do puzzles um we did a john deere puzzle last night he's a big fan of sorry right he now. loves the, the game, game sorry yeah when we're both playing with him he yeah. just like yeah, doesn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> yeah, just lights up. It's so cute. Uh, but as far as business hours go, I mean, we are, we stay up way too late. So we don't get started until usually like mm, just before mid-morning. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, because there's some work that we have to do after the kids are both down. Um, and then we go until about 5, 5.30. Usually we're done by 5. Mm -hmm. And then we're with the kids. Yeah. Yeah, and we're, we're working. Like, I'll bring them out with me because Samantha will roll around too and I'll water while they're both with me or I will gather, like load up the truck with Benjamin. I'll do that kind of stuff with the we kids. do a lot of gator rides. A lot of gator rides. Which actually is really nice because Samantha loves it. Benjamin's okay with it at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a good opportunity for us to just kind of like survey things mm -hmm. and get a game plan for the next day or like you might see like, oh, we need to put more drip in this area. We do carry something. drip supplies and sometimes we'll just stop and fix the problem right away yeah. and the kids kind of wander around and then we load back up and go make another pass through. Yeah. Our neighbors are probably like, <laughs> I mean, it's just constant. What would we do without yeah. drip supplies? I don't know. Like Or a gator. Or a gator. Honestly. You know what? I think if you've got over five acres, 
you really kind of need, if well, it depends developed. on what you're doing with yeah. your five acres. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you're working your five acres, you really need some type of a small vehicle, mm -hmm. even if it was a little pickup, right. but just something to get kind of to and fro. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Other than we didn't address, so we, I don't think we did a recap when we did the garden tours, but we did announce the new land that we bought in one of the garden tours. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much, that's just right at three acres. Yeah, j uh, barely under, I think. It's like a 2.9 yeah. or 2.8 something. Yeah. It's really close to three. Um, so we'll show you, I mean, we've showed it in that video, in the tour video. Yeah, we uh, have a fence. We're going to put a fence up in July that's mm -hmm. scheduled for just on one side because there's a fence on two sides of it. Mm -hmm. And then there's brush on one side and we're not going to fence that because mm -hmm. uh, there's like a ditch that runs through there. I love like that ditch with ditch. all the, the trees and yeah. shrubs, natural. So we're just going to have a fence on one side of it to kind of close it off from the neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't know what we're going to do with the fence you know, we've got our driveway and there's a fence, you know, on there's the maple lane. It depends on what we end up doing with it. So the fence this year is pretty much all that we're going to be doing with the land that we know that we have planned for other than, um, you know, Aaron's using it to dump his grass clippings and we're dumping compost material back there. Um, we've also got a pile of wood chips. We'll probably still have them deliver wood chips and just start spreading them. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, okay. So here's something we are going to do this fall. I want to have Chad come with his like big road grader and level the whole thing like late into the fall. Um, and then I kind of want to seed it with like a pasture, pasture mix. Mm -hmm. Like a dry land, well, probably recommend. a dry land pasture mix. But just something dry land, mm -hmm. you don't you don't irrigate it, nothing, just let the winter moisture, you Bring know, it do its thing. Mm -hmm. Cause I think you, you seed that in the fall, right? Yeah, oh, Typically. it's a good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if he, if he levels it all um, with his road grader and then seed it, mm -hmm. we'll just let it kind of do its thing at that mm -hmm. point but I, I do kind of want to level the whole thing because there there's some weird there is and it does go down in the back quite yeah. a lot um so it, yeah we've got, had so many ideas of what we could use it for i mean it depends like at this point we'll probably just i mean just treat it as we are right now and then if we do have a pasture possibly we'll have a barn and some horses maybe yeah we have maybe to work with, a lavender field we have maybe. to work with the city though because it's um zoned Urban, urban growth yeah and so the city wants to see a subdivision go there which is precisely why we bought it because we want to make sure a subdivision doesn't go there um, but that's eventually what they want to go there so if we wanted to build a barn what we would have to do is we'd have to actually send it to an engineer to to show like how a subdivision would go they call there it a plat map right or a yeah you create a plat map yeah um and then you'd be kind of like you'd be dedicating the space for roads and everything and then what you would do is you'd show the barn going on one of those lots, like on the back side. So if, if we did maybe three acres, I don't know if the city would let us do like one acre lots, mm. like maybe three one acre lots. Uh -huh. And then the barn would go on one of those lots within the boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that way the city can approve it by saying, yeah, in the future, you know, whatever you do with this land, when it gets subdivided, somebody's just going to have a barn in the backyard. Mm -hmm. On a one acre lot, that might make sense for one person to have a barn. I don't know, one acre is a shop. A shop. Yeah. You like it, yeah. They just want to make sure that you don't need to tear down a building mm -hmm. once it gets subdivided. Right. So that's what we have to do. So it's mm -hmm. it'd be involved yeah. to get a barn in there. So whatever um, we end up doing, it'll just take some time to figure it out and we've got plenty going on here. The one thing we could also look into is we could maybe be able to put up like a pole barn with no floor, mm. just like a gravel floor or something. Yeah. The city may allow us to put something like that in Without there a foundation. with no we still need a permit, but but no foundation, but no services. Like no, there won't be a sewer system or anything because then it'd be like easier that. for the city to be like, no, you got to tear that down when the subdivision you mm -hmm. know is going to go in, right? Um, since there's no foundation, mm -hmm. so there could be other options. We'll see. It's all fun, exciting stuff, but yeah. future stuff for now. Anyway, that is it, you guys, for this recap video and hopefully we'll get back on a little bit of a better schedule here in a week or two and we'll just try to squeeze them in as we have time to we have been posting except for this last sunday uh, because we just like ran out of time somehow um but we have been posting a lot so we've been posting on saturdays we posted on a sunday or two on our main channel um so yeah if you don't see a recap go up on a sunday check the main channel there might be a new video there for you to see so anyway thank you guys so much for watching this video i hope you're all doing really well and we will see you in the next one bye